You are tuning in to Lone Star Community Radio on 104.5 KCZW LP Conroe and 106.1 KZCC LP Conroe and worldwide at IRLoneStar.com. All righty. Good afternoon. I uh, hope you're able to join us today or I'm glad you're able to join us today for the Agricultural Toolbox. Uh, you're kind of just watching the weather. Everybody's been able to enjoy a little bit of rainfall. We got extremely dry uh, the last three weeks, uh, waiting for this rainfall to start, basically kind of the tail end of last week. But uh, it's a welcome need. Uh, most of our pastures were getting extremely dry. Uh, grasses weren't growing because of the cool nights, but I think everything's kind of falling in place now, and there's actually been some hay cut, and some of the pastures are responding to some fertilizer and the moisture, so our livestock has got something to graze on out there now. But along with the moisture comes in some of the uh, problems that go along with uh, wildlife, the, our habitat, I should say, outside, and some moisture kind of brings things along. And uh, there's a couple of pests out there that really started showing up the last few days. And if you enjoy being outside, particularly in the evening hours there, uh, right before dusk, uh, horsefly and horseflies and deer flies are two of the culprits that'll come in and just really make life difficult. Uh, they're extremely uh, persistent as far as they're bugging you. And they're really bad about the livestock. And that's one thing that we wanted to talk a little bit about today. But the horse flies and deer flies are very striking in their appearance. If you've seen these guys, they're fairly large flies with aggressive biting habits. And again, they're familiar to most people. If you've been outside at all, uh, you've come in, in contact with these guys. Uh, uh, again, uh, can be extremely large in their size. Uh, the the uh, flies that we'll typically see on livestock, they can range from three quarters of an inch to an inch and a quarter long. And they usually have the clear, uh, clear or solid colored wings and the brightly colored eyes. And again, the deer, the horse flies have got the great big old dark body on them with the clear, clear wings, which are easy to see. And uh, they are able to bite, and that's uh, they have got an interesting bite the way they actually do. They've got a slicing, uh, piercing, or a slicing type of ma mandible mouthpiece that actually slices the skin, creates a hole, then uh, blood starts weeping out of that. Then they actually wick up the blood. It's not like a mosquito or something like that. It's actually you know, you know, pulling a, a blood meal from uh, an animal or a person. They actually slice the skin, and it creates a rather painful bite. And as they uh, then they start mopping up the blood as it starts to bleed from the, the bite that they've caused. So, again, these guys are, are uh, uh, persistent this time of year, and they're kind of short-lived. They'll go on for about a two-, three-week period there, but uh, dealing with them gets to be a real problem. But, again, horsefly, deer fly. Uh, the horsefly's got a little more a pronounced head and abdomen structure. Deer fly a little more triangular in its shape. Uh, but again, both of them are very uh, painful as far as dealing with. But numer numerous painful bites from large populations of these flies when they're attacking uh, livestock will reduce milk production in our dairy cattle and beef cattle both. And this time of year, we've got a lot of calves on the ground, so we start to see uh, some losses as animals are moving around trying to get away from the uh, insect activity as a consequence everything starts to suffer they're being more uh, uh, being uh, aggravated so their milk production falls off plus they're moving around calves are not able to nurse so it actually creates quite a bit of a problem but they interfere with the grazing of cattle and horses and because animals are under attack they, uh, they actually will bunch together which is a native a natural protective instinct that livestock will do which actually compounds the problem and makes it easier for the uh, flies to gather on these guys and be persistent on the way they work. But blood losses can be significant in the USDA bulletin that was published several years ago estimates that horn flies can consume one cc of blood for their meal and then they calculated that 20 to 30 flies you know feeding for six hours would take about 20 teaspoons away from an animal so that would amount to about one quart of blood in a 10-day period so that can be pretty significant when you're talking about animals and, and the way they're feeding on people and things like that so again the female flies and the, uh, and the female horse flies and deer flies are actively feeding during the day but you really see more of that activity right before dusk because the sun starts to go down they get out there and get more active and the, fl the flies are apparently are attracted to such things as movement shiny surfaces, the carbon dioxide, which is going to be breathed out of animals, and uh, the warmth of, of the uh, animals, if it's a cool morning or cool evening, things like that. Once on a host, uh, again, these uh, flies use their mouth, their knife-like mouth parts to slice the skin and then feed on the blood pool that's created. Uh, the life cycle of these guys, that's what we need, need to kind of be aware of, and it's something we really can't do much about, and that's the, the challenging thing about these particular insects 
is because of their ability to uh, utilize a wide variety of areas to create their life cycle. The life cycle of the horsefly or the deer fly species develops in the mud along pond edges or stream beds, wetlands, and even seep areas. Uh, some are aquatic and some are actually developed on very dry soil, so they don't have to have standing water, things like that. Females may uh, lay batches of 25 up to 1,000 eggs on vegetation that stands over the water or these wetland areas. The larvae that hatch from these eggs fall to the ground and feed upon decaying or organic matter, uh, small organisms in the, in the soil and the water. The larvae stage uh, usually lasts from one to three years. So again, you're not looking at a full life cycle occurring uh, any one season. Depending on the species, the mature larvae crawl to dry areas and pupate and ultimately emerge as adults. And that's what you're getting a look at as far as the adults coming out there and feeding. The biggest problem that you see with these guys is that they are such predators and that's the one thing that gets to be the problem with these guys because they are uh, such a predator in, in the way they, they consume other things. They're actually kind of solitary as far as the larval stage because they will eat a variety of other flies as well as themselves when they're actually feeding. So that's what we kind of be looking at as far as that goes. Uh, control again, because they're in these wetland areas <clears throat> and such a vast area, being able to come in and spray an area with an insecticide is going to be very difficult. And because of the wide variety of areas, throughout Southeast Texas where they can be. There's no practical approach. So again, we're looking at basically some kind of repellent or a uh, deterrent on the animals themselves. Uh, as far as actually go out there and spraying, that doesn't work because they fly, uh, they get that blood meal we talked about. And what they'll do is feed it once and then three to four days later, that same fly may be back then, but they're not something that's every day. So again, getting a handle on this population and maybe one evening why you see many more flies at that time, and another evening, there may not be much activity at all. It just it depends on the, the last blood meal that they had. And again, a little bit different as far as their uh, their activities. Uh, the deer flies will typically like upper regions of the body, so the head, shoulders, top lines on livestock, whereas the horse fly, they're more attracted to the legs, lower portions of the body, and that's where you'll typically see them feeding on the, those portions of the animal. So again, both of them are very painful. They're uh, quite a bit of a problem on that part. But again, horse flies and deer flies are significant pet, uh, livestock pests. And again, it's painful and persistent behavior. Their attacks reduction actually cause reduction in weight gain. This has been documented, reduced milk, milk uh, yields, reduced in uh, uh, fed uh, utilization when these animals are, are being fed. And we're looking at reduced utilization. So the puncture wounds actually damage the hide also. So they are quite devastating to the livestock industry. And that's not even talking about us as far as humans being outside, interacting with, you know, trying to be out in the evening or helping take care of our livestock, doing chores in the evening time. One thing we need to look at also is for as the uh, you know, horses are con concerned, uh, EIA, e e EIA, which is equine infectious anemia, also referred to as swamp fever, is a common, which is very common throughout this part of the United States. We do not have a vaccine for it, but this is one particular virus that is very uh, thought to be very tr transmitted by the horse flies, deer flies. So again, uh, watching these populations, keeping the uh, activity levels down around these horses so that if the you know, EIA is present in a particular state uh, area then, or in these pastures, then we are looking at uh, possible transmission. So it, it, again, this is a viral disease that causes lethargy, weight loss, and sometimes death in an infected animal. There are two strains of the virus that can be found in this area. One is more intense than the other, and the acute infected horse almost always dies a very quick death as a result of EIA. So again, it's one of those, if you've been familiar with uh, the quarantines on EIA management through the Animal Texas Animal Health Commission, you're realizing that those animals are basically confined to quarters and not able to be transmitted or transported or used anyplace else. Let's go ahead and take a break right now, and we'll come back and talk a little bit more about their control, but then move on to a couple other problems that we might be seeing this time of year because of the moisture. Thank you very much. A Lone Star Community Radio is looking for those who are interested in hosting their own talk show with monthly and weekly slots available on Conroe's FM 104.5, 106.1, and on IRLoneStar.com. Start your own podcast, create your first YouTube channel, and be on TV. Contact Lone Star Community Radio online at IRLoneStar.com or Call the station message line at 936-647-3776 to take your first step into the radio world.
All righty. Glad you're able, to, you're able to be with us today. Again, we were talking a little bit about the horse flies and deer flies, how they're affecting both our livestock, our pets, and even us as people trying to get out there and enjoy the evenings. The, it has been a little bit sultry the last night or two, but again, we're still trying to get outside and utilize the hours after we get off work. And again, there's a lot of folks like you know, tend to their livestock and riding horses and things like that. And these two particular pests that we've been talking about are extremely um, uh, aggressive in their uh, persistence to bother us. And again, if you're trying to ride an animal that is fighting flies, if he's staying in a roping box ready to go and all of a sudden he's stomping there trying to get rid of a fly, it gets to be a challenge. But control of these flies, the horse, horse flies and deer flies is very difficult. Insecticides are usually ineffective since the insects spend little time on the animal themselves. Insecticide treatments for, uh, of the breeding areas uh, is also very impractical. We talked earlier about the fact that it can be all throughout the woods anytime we've got a little bit of moisture in the area. It uh, doesn't even have to be a standing a pool, pond, creek, things like that. It can be just a wet area after some rainfall there that has persisted for a few days. And uh, that's enough of that. So you matter, uh, that's enough of that. It doesn't take a large area to allow those guys to get started. So realizing that we've got a tremendous amount of habitat out there. So really trying to stay away from tree lines, areas there where they're able to move out of and come to what we talked about earlier as far as being drawn to the carbon dioxide out of the animals, shiny surfaces, things like that. They all draw them to us. Several factors that have been, uh, that have been suggested to explain the difficulties in controlling horse flies is usually a situation where they're not feasible to handle animals on a frequent schedule. You know, if you've got you know, cattle out there in a 100-acre pasture there and they don't always come up and they're standing in the woods or places like that, we don't gather them. Plus, the fact is that many of us have got schedules such that we may only see those animals on the weekends. So that gets to be a challenge as far as applying some kind of a repellent on a regular basis. Some of these factors are, again, the you know, relatively large size of the flies, which increases the dose of insecticide necessary to produce mortality on these on the insects. Uh, the brief period that the animal, when they, the, the brief period of time that they are, the fly is actually on the animal, that would make an extre extremely potent type of insecticide to basically deter them because they're not going to get enough of a feeding activity out of the blood there to be able to cause a lethal dose and the continued emergence and, uh, emergence and uh, host seeking of the females of numerous uh, species over the relatively long period and the ability to fly from emergent sites uh, that uh, can be considerable distance. These guys are powerful flyers, and they can go quite some distance from an emergent site to finding a host blood meal. So, again, it can be extremely difficult. And, again, the wide range of larvae habitat that we've got in this area produces uh, just an exceptional amount of uh, difficulty in trying to control these guys. So some, some degrees of repellence, uh, rep uh, repellency you know, can be used on the, for a two- to three-day period on our livestock. Pyrethrins, uh, some of the pyrethroids are labeled for livestock direct application. Some of them are premise only, so you need to be able to read those labels and to be sure what you're looking at. And again, use of these mixtures uh, you know, will benefit our livestock owners in areas of heavy infestation. But insecticides currently registered for uh, cattle only uh, provide moderate control of these flies. And again, uh, most of the people are going to be utilizing your DEET off-type products or the things like that are basically they're not a toxicant, they're repellent in trying to get them away from us. So that's the kind of what we're facing as far as trying to control these guys is all we can hope for is it's a short period of time that they're present and active in our area. And uh, just we need to be able to be able to move on in, on that area. Another fly that's in this area that's you know, I'm seeing a lot of them on the livestock right now and it does not take long for their populations to grow is the horn fly. And again, that's something we face every year. We did do uh, uh, three different herd uh, demonstrations last summer, and uh, we did find that uh, the ear tags, there are some pyrethrins, there are some diazinon-based uh, ear tags, and both of those treatments required an ear tag in each ear, but we did see significant reduction, uh, kind of the threshold that most of our labels look at. If there's more than 200 flies per animal, then that's the threshold there that uh, we want to make sure that we're uh, providing some kind of relief to those animals on the horn fly, because Again, their feeding activity is different from what we talked about in the deer fly or the horse fly. Again, their persistence, there's a lot of those on the animal. And, and again, they'll just turn the cow black as far as there's so many of them. But, you know, 200, you know, you get to think about that. That, that may think like it's a lot, but it's not many when you see 1,000. But basically, the ear tags we utilized last year, our demonstration showed because we actually did once a week counts on those animals to watch about the efficacy and the longevity of those tags. And we found that we were able to keep those fly numbers down to less than 25 and 30 per animal uh, when we applied them in June and actually monitored them all the way till late September. 
So that is a tool that we've got out there. It does work on the horn flies, not so effective on the horse fly or the deer fly. But again, horn fly numbers are out there. They're increasing. And again, they've got the same negative effect on our livestock as we talked about the other animals, their persistence. Their feeding activity does create some anemia. And uh, again, it's just a persistence. They're bothering those animals. They're moving around. They're not grazing. They're not growing. They're not lactating, growing calves. And uh, it goes so reduced efficiency all the way around. So again, being aware of those guys is extremely important. And providing some relief to them is going to be critical. One other thing I wanted to go ahead and mention before we get too far into this is going to be the army worms. Again, that's another uh, pest that's going to be present. Last year, we see we saw populations uh, just uh, probably five and six generations normally once or twice uh, generations during a, in any one field during a growing season but last year they really persisted so again it's hard to tell what's going to happen this year we may not see any at all but uh, the fall army worm is a, is a true pest that's in our pastures and again we've got a lot of young tender growth is starting to grow right now moisture's hit us so the early uh, growth and we've got a lot of stall tall standing mature vegetation along the fence rows and in overgrown areas there that they will be migrating out of and uh, it's just a matter of monitoring those fields, looking for damage because they will completely consume a field. You can look like you've got a nice stand of grass today. You walk out there and they'll look out there the next morning and it'll all be laid over and it's just like you came in and mowed it last night and there's nothing left. So the fall army worm is a pest of our Bermuda grasses and it does affect also your sorghum, wheat and, and rye grasses. But again, this uh, we're more concerned. We've gotten past the rye grass or cool annual stages. So we're looking at trying to protect our Bermuda grass stands that we're going to be growing for the rest of the season. Uh, the larvae of the fall armyworm are green, brown, or black with a yellow to whitish lines running from the head to the tail and a distinct white line between the eyes forms an inverted Y pattern on their face. Four black spots aligned in a square on the top of the segment near the back of the end of the caterpillar are also characteristics of the fall armyworm. Armyworms are usually small when we start scouting early on, less than an eighth of an inch at first, and then when these uh, you know, little plant damage is seen at that period of time, but it does not take long for them to grow. The damage and the resulting infestation may not be noticed early on. You'll just maybe see a little spot out there the size of the kitchen table or something like that, and you just kind of look past that. But larvae feed for two to three weeks and then reach a full-grown stage of an inch, inch and a half, and at that time, they've got an immense an appetite and their numbers and marching ability. That's when they can actually strip a field. And they've actually got moved into some landscape areas and stripped off vegetation on the landscape at night also. But once the army worm larvae completes feeding, it tunnels into the soil to a depth of about an inch, enters the pupil, the pupil stage, and uh, the army worm moth emerges into from the pupil stage in about 10 days and repeats this life cycle. So again, it's a matter of us marching, watching what's going on. If you're glancing out there and seeing a bunch of little brown moths, you know that you're in the middle of a life cycle and it's, act it's time to get busy and get something done. But the fall armyworm moth has a wingspan of about an inch and a half. Um, a lot of them are smaller than that that you may be seeing in those fields, but the front pair of wings are dark gray with an irregular pattern of light and dark areas. And the moths are active at night and then when they feed on the uh, nectar, and the deposit those egg masses to, to uh, restart that generation. A single female can deposit up to 2,000 eggs, and there are four to five generations per year if the, you know, the conditions permit it. So that's why you can see that this thing can get out of hand right quick as far as population growth, damage to your fields, and then again, one stand or one generation will move right back into another if we don't intervene and stop those growth going on. But populations increase in our area in the early spring, successive generations, if moisture is present, and uh, they just, again, they will persist, and we'll have more problems going on. Uh, it's a matter of spraying. There's easy things to do as far as kind of controlling these guys, and there are a number of products out there that can be utilized. Um, some of them are restricted use. Some of them are uh, just general use products, but there are a number of things out there. And, again, get with your feed stores. Uh, if you suspect there's some damage, get with them because a lot of times in the runs, like last year, the feed stores had an awful tough time trying to keep up with the keeping product in hand just because the uh, enormous uh, number of acres that were affected, the amount of retreatment that was going on, there was a number for uh, quite a period of time there was is hard to come up with product enough to uh, uh, get the populations under control. So we were resorting to some other products that maybe were not as, uh, you know, as efficient as we'd like, or maybe we're not as cost effective as we like. As some of the products, there is a variability in the cost, and uh, that will make a determination on what we would like to use. 
Let's take a break, and we'll come back and talk a little bit about the insecticides labeled for armyworm control and uh, kind of come back and visit about that a little bit. Our talk shows and music shows are looking for sponsors. Want to expand your brand awareness? Reach the hyper-local audience in Montgomery County? Lone Star Community Radio sponsorships accomplish this. Want to see our stats and rates? Check out IRLoneStar.com slash sponsor for more information. Or call in and leave us a message at 936-647-3776 with your question. Get seen on TV or YouTube and heard on our podcast, FM, and internet radio. Sponsor your local radio station with Lone Star Community Radio. All righty. Welcome back to the Agricultural Toolbox with the Extension Service. And uh, again, uh, we appreciate you listening to our program and invite you to come by our office. It's located over there on 9020 Airport Road across the street from the convention center. But we do a wide variety of uh, programs there, both horticulture, FCS, 4-H, agriculture, and again, deal with a, a wide variety of situations there. In fact, we were out this morning looking at a set of cattle there that are being fed for a sale later on this spring, so or this summer, I should say. And uh, the cattle are on feed right now, or just going on feed, so we're trying to predict what their gain is going to be, make sure vaccinations are in place so that we can keep them in optimum health so they're able to move on through the growing season. We were talking about army worms before we went to break and the fact that uh, they can be so devastating on our pastures, uh, whether you got livestock out there or if it's a hay field, again, you're counting on a cutting and all of a sudden you come out there, get ready to uh, cut that field for hay and uh, realize the army worms have already cut it for you and destroyed it. So you basically uh, spent money on fertilizer, herbicide, uh, and have that field ready to go, and then all of a sudden you've got a loss there because the field is gone and not that ability to recover those costs that you've incurred at that particular time. But the key to managing fall armyworms is frequent inspection of the fields to uh, detect fall armyworm infestations before they may cause economic damage, and that's the thing we need to be looking at. We talked earlier about scouting, and I know this gets to be difficult because of a lot of our business schedules, uh, not at the ability to get out there even every evening or in the morning before you leave out and see what's going on in those fields if you're finding some feeding spots. And typically they're going to be along the margins of the field uh, or might next to an area there where it has some stalled, uh, stalled tall standing vegetation uh, that they've been able to overwinter in waiting for uh, the younger tender vegetation to come about. Once larvae are greater than three-quarters of an inch, the quality of forage they can uh, eat increases to the quantity of the forage they can increase they eat will increase dramatically uh, during their fall two and three days of feeding uh, their final two three days of feeding army worms consume 80 percent of the total forage consumed during the entire development so realizing that if we let them get over an inch uh, at that point in time that's when we get a population out there that can really just basically decimate a field the diversity the density of the army worms sufficient to justify insecticide treatment depends on the stage of crop growth and the, and the value of the crop. But again, if we're looking or counting on that hay field there as, as far as the source of income, then we're going to be treating it as a special situation. Seedling plants can tolerate fewer army worms uh, than established plants. And again, infestations of more than two and three army worms, again, half inch or larger per square foot may justify an insecticide application. If practical, apply insecticides early in the morning or late in the evening when armyworm larvae are most active. They're not going to be out there during the heat of the day, so that's why we want to look in the morning or evening them as far as doing your scouting to see if we're seeing any activity. They're going to be laid up during the heat of the day, not trying to be uh, stressed, and therefore most likely to come in contact with insecticide spray. So if we target those times of day, and also will be less likely to impact our bee populations if we do at that time of day also. If the field is near harvest and early or an early harvest rather than insecticide treatment may be an option. So again, if it's a situation they're out there, uh, go ahead and cut that field a little bit quicker. As soon as you cut it with a mower prior to a baling, that does stop the army worm activity on that field. Or go ahead and put your know, livestock grazing pressure in on that field right quick, double up on the animals, put them in there, let them graze it down, then get them out so that field can recover. Parasitic wasps and flies, ground beetles and insect viruses can help suppress army worm numbers. However, these natural enemies can be overwhelmed when large numbers of the migrating moths move into an area 
and weather conditions like we're seeing right now as far as plenty of, mo of moisture, moderate temperatures, and make a, your high survival rate of eggs and larvae going on. So insecticides label for armyworm control in our pastures and our hay fields. Again, they always re look at the label to make sure it's going to fall within the confines of your particular situation. Again, the label is the law, and that's what we have to, to uh, uh, follow. But uh, labels, labels, lab follows label instructions. And uh, kind of looking at some of the products that are out there that are labeled for this use, Zerate Z. Uh, this is a 13.1% formulation. It's labeled for the fall armyworm and grasshoppers. Uh, the pasture and rangeland grasses, grass grown for hay and silage, and grass grown from seed is labeled for those particular situations. Pasture and rangeland grass may be used uh, for may be used for used for grazing or cut uh, for forage zero days after application. So again, zero restrictions. Do not cut grass to be dried and harvested if grass until seven days after the last application. And again, this is a restricted use insecticide. Uh, Lab Lab DC Lab Desi is another product that's labeled out there for fall, fall armyworms and grasshoppers, pasture and gra and uh, rangeland situations. Grass grown for hay and silage, and grass grown for seed are also falling under this label. And pasture and pasture and rangeland grasses may be used for use in, in uh, grazing, and they cut for uh, forage zero days after application. And again, uh, with these kind of products, it is also a restricted use product, so we need to be careful in the way we're going to uh, uh, make sure it's a licensed applicator is going to be put, putting this product out there. Again, Mustang Max, that's another product that's out there. It's uh, 9.6. Zeta Cypermethrin is the product, uh, active ingredient in that. And it's also labeled for fall armyworm and grasshopper control. Applications may be made up to zero days uh, for forage and day and hay and then seven days for straw and scre seed screening. So again, there's restrictions on there for harvest for seed. But again, if we're looking at cutting it for hay or for grazing applications, zero uh, restrictions on that. It also is a restricted use her uh, herbicide insecticide. Uh, tombstone, again, that's another product that's out there. It's labeled also for the fall armyworm and grasshoppers. And it's utilized for pasture, rangeland, grass grown for hay and seed, zero days to grazing and harvest hay. So again, it's also a restricted use product. So again, if you've not got your pesticide applicators licensed from TDA that we help to do the trainings for, you can see on some of these products, if that's the only option you've got, having that that uh, applicator license can be very valuable and allow you to use these products. Warrior 2, again, that's a uh, sahalothrin is an active ingredient in Warrior 2. This is a particular product that we're actually looking at uh, for the uh, Tawny crazy ant. Uh, when we're looking at some of our pasture situations, uh, trying to keep uh, or create some uh, calving pastures there so we can keep those ants out of those areas, that's where the uh, Warrior 2 is a product we've been finding that uh, effective on, on killing or removing the crazy ants out of those areas and allow us to have that. But again, it's also labeled for armyworm and grasshoppers, pasture and rangeland grasses, grass grown for hay and silage, and grown for, uh, grass grown for seed. Are also following this and pasture and uh, rangeland grass may be used for uh, gr you know, gr uh, grass cutting and forages up to zero days after application so again no grazing restrictions on that particular product and uh, again if you're going to make it for a uh, uh, bedding material then it's, it's going to be a seven day restriction on that it is also a restricted use product Bathroid is uh, XL is another product that's out there and uh, it's also labeled for fall armyworm and grasshopper use it's labeled for pastures, rangeland, grass grown for hay and seed, and zero days for grazing and hay harvest, and it is also a restricted use product. Demolin 2L is another product that's out there in the market. It's labeled for fall armyworms and immature grasshoppers, and Demolin must be applied before the armyworm larvae reach a half inch or larger. Again, so that's one of those that's not going to be effective on the larger insects, so Make sure that if we are scouting, and this is a product we've got in our cabinet there as far as a product to be utilized, make sure that we're scouting and got that population under control. And it provides residual control up to two to three weeks. That's the nice thing about this product. So if we're getting, getting it, catching it early in the cycle, then we're good to go. The Siege is another product that's out there. Uh, Sahaloethrin is another uh, product out there. Uh, this Besiege is the active ingredient there, fall armyworm and grasshopper control. 
pasture and rangeland grasses may be cut uh, zero days before after application. So again, it's something that's wide open. 74F, 7XLR, 780S soluble powder. Uh, the generic carburetals are all labeled for armyworm and grasshopper control. This is a popular product. It's been around for a long, long time. When applied to pastures, there is a 14-day waiting period before grazing and harvesting. It's not a restricted-use product, but again, looking at, you know, there is a grazing restriction and a hay harvest restriction if we're going to use this product. So again, looking at another one is Malathion 57% or Malathion ULV, and these are also labeled for armyworms and grasshoppers, zero days to harvest and grazing for the Malathion. Intrepid is another product that's popular with a lot of our producers. Uh, it's labeled for armyworms, not for grasshoppers. Begin applications when the first signs of the armyworms begin to appear. Use the higher rates for heavier infestation, so it's got a range instead of a set application rate. And do not harvest hay within seven days of the application. So we are looking at a restriction on that. Zero days for grazing, though, but for the hay, we do have that problem. It is not a restricted-use product. And the last product we're looking at is Tracer. Treat armyworm eggs uh, you know, when they hatch, and then larvae when they're small. Use higher rates for larger larvae and uh, do not graze until spray is dry and do not harvest hay or fodder within three days of the treatment period. So, again, these are some products that are labeled out there. And, uh, again, they will provide us excellent control if we get it out there in a timely fashion. And whether we're fighting weeds or these insects, again, remembering that the smaller, uh, the younger that particular pest is, the more effective our, our, our uh, treatment regime is going to be. Again, we've talked about that in the past as far as spraying weeds. We catch them in the two and three leaf opposed to the mature size. We get much better control. And again, same way on the uh, these are, uh, insect pests also. We catch them early in their life cycle. A lot less product is, utilized, is ne needed to affect a control. And then also we just reduce the chances of having another generation getting started in that field, reducing the damage that's going to come our way. Let's go ahead and take a break, and we'll be back in a few minutes for a few comments on some programs coming up. A Lone Star Community Radio is Montgomery County's radio station with talk, music, weather, and traffic for Montgomery County. Have a question or comment about one of our shows? Want to know how to reach a host? Just contact the station at IRLoneStar.com or call in and leave a message at 936-647-3776. Get involved with your community with Lone Star Community Radio. We're glad to have you with us again today. I thought we'd uh, end up the program. Well, one other thing I forgot to mention earlier, we were talking about the horse flies. Uh, Dr. Sonia Swagger, one of our entomologists out of Stephenville, has done a lot of research. And again, we were talking about the fact that the horn fly, horse flies and uh, deer flies are extremely difficult to gain control of. The repellents on the animals will give us some relief, but they've actually got some traps. And you can go to our uh, TAMU Extension website and see some of these traps. They actually use some depots pieces of plexiglass, and uh, but there's some designs there that some traps that actually do work on the horse flies, and it's, you know, they spent some time uh, developing those designs, and uh, that is one tool that seems like it is giving us some relief. Uh, again, a lot of people don't want to go to the trouble of trying to set up something like that, but again, it is an opportunity out there. If you've got extremely large populations of horse flies in your pastures uh, bothering your livestock or bothering you around the home, uh, it is an option, so you might want to look at those types of things. I thought we'd talk a moment about some programs coming up. Right now we are in the middle of uh, getting ready for our validation program. The validations are going to be um, a certification process that we go through for all of our kiddos that have got livestock projects, starting with the state fair that's coming up in October. Uh, that would be for our steers, swine, goats, sheep, heifers. And then also uh, the steers that we'll be validating in the month of June are all for the major shows uh, next year, which includes uh, Odessa, San Antonio, uh, Fort Worth, Houston, Austin, San Angelo, all those shows, those animals actually go through a validation process. So we've got the ag teachers together and agents together last month in the month of May, planned them. The tail end of uh, June is when we typically validate all those animals. And it's a process where they come together and we take uh, pulled DNA. So we get uh, DNA background information, their tag, nose print, 
and that goes into a system there so the animals are officially on feed. So that's going to occupy a lot of our June as far as working with our youth projects, getting those ready so they are certified for the feeding program and able to compete in the shows uh, later this fall and then into next spring. So, yeah, they kind of just, you know, get the animals out of the barn, the new ones are coming right in behind them. So uh, it's, it's about a year-round process for the steers that we utilize in our feeding programs. Program coming up on June 15, uh, 16, it's a Friday evening. We'll start at 5 o'clock. We're going to be out there at Billy Wood's place called the Frenchman Place, and it's on uh, 1097 south of Montgomery. Uh, it's right at six-tenths of a mile past uh, Keenan's cutoff there. But at this particular program, it'll be a ranch tour. We're going to be inside the barn there for talking about some equipment early on. Then we're going to get out there on the pastures and drive around out there and look at everything from some aquatic management. Uh, we've got some food plots out there for the dove that we'll be looking at. Then he's also got a wide variety of grasses. Dr. Baron Rector with uh, is our range specialist from College Station will be with us that evening talking about a lot of the utilization of these different grasses, different opportunities for different operations, how they can be utilized. Uh, we've also got a neat thing where we've, uh, there's been a lot of talk about use of drones and a lot of it's recreational and things like that. But we've got a gentleman coming out that day that uh, we're actually going to do some mapping earlier that week, but we'll be presenting those maps. But uh, you know, vegetation, health, uh, some contours, there's some information that we can get out of use of drones. Um, I mean, a lot of people will you know, utilize them. We've seen use of them for marketing livestock already and, again, for real estate. Those things have all been used. But uh, there's some software out there that uh, we've been able to uh, learn about. And there's a gentleman out of uh, New Caney that's actually got a business. He'll be with us that day, and we're going to be actually looking at the use of drones, their applications, some of the software that's available to us. Uh, we'll have uh, NRCS will be there. We've actually got some, we'll talk about farm plan development. I think we've got a cooperator that we need to recognize for some, ex some excellent work in 2016. And uh, then also we'll have some information on USD, Farm, farm Service Agency. There's some program updates that we'll be looking at. Also look at some sprayer calibration. Billy's got some equipment out there, and uh, so we'll look at that. But get out there around the place and kind of look at uh, just, you know, how you can take your place and adapt it. Apply some of these things. Not all apply, but some things you can uh, pick up one or two things that will work for you. But if you'll call our extension office and uh, make sure that you've got uh, your name on the list before Friday the 16th so we can make sure that we've got plenty of food on hand. And then, again, prepare enough seating because we are going to load up on a flatbed trailer and go back into the place and uh, tour some of the activities and some of the different food plots. He's got switchgrass, Bermuda grass jigs, uh, 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 eastern gamma grass. Uh, so, so there's a lot of different things on his place that you can kind of see, see if that's something that you want to utilize on your place. So, again, that's Friday, June 16, and uh, I think it would be a very worthwhile day as long as the weather cooperates. We tried to do this last spring. And the rains that we had back there, Memorial Day floods, washed out his roads, so we had to cancel that program. So we're going to give it a shot this year and see if it does come together. Another program coming up, uh, again, uh, June and July are, are full of validation. I think most people try to take a vacation or two in July. Uh, we've got state horse show, things like that will be keeping us busy. But our uh, Montgomery County Adult Horse Committee has got a two-evening uh, program series set up for August 1 and 13, or 15. Uh, two different sessions there. We're going to focus on a variety of things, uh, you know, animal health, utilizing some of the agencies like the uh, Texas Animal Health Commission or veterinarians, hoof care, just some of the kinds of things that involve all aspects of uh, equine uh, management and health and even some facilities management. We're going to be covering those, those two evenings. They'll start at 6 o'clock in the evening, but uh, mark down the 1st and the 15th and uh, we'll get more information out to you. We've been, got a planning meeting at the tail end of next week. We're actually finalizing the details and our speakers for that uh, really uh, comprehensive type of program going on. Wanted to uh, you know, just follow up by saying, again, we encourage you folks, if you've got a question about your piece of property, business you're trying to develop, our leadership advisory board actually identified working with our residents there as far as uh, small business development, if it's going to be out of the home, looking at some of the restrictions, uh, assistance that's out there, uh, the deed restrictions that apply to a you know, facility there that uh, operating a business out of the home or off your property, uh, you know, tax implications, uh, you know, the uh, uh, ex exemption through the comptroller's office, the timber tax evaluation. There's all sorts of things that we can do discussing in those programs. But again, if you've got something you want to look at, Call us at the extension office. Let's sit down and visit and uh, see what your goals are and then help you go ahead and, and uh, accomplish those goals. That's what our job is, is to uh, help you reach your goals and whatever resources you've got, 
you know, we'll put those to their best use and then we'll move forward with that. So our office is located there, and I mentioned earlier, 9020 Airport Road, uh, on the just outside of uh, the North Loop, Northeast Loop, and the northeast side of Conroe. Our number is 936-539-7822. And again, there's a message machine. So if you call after hours, we're typically 8 to 5, but again, we do a lot of evening programs. So leave a word, we will get back with you and follow up. And even if it's a diagnostic problem, I've mean, already had calls this week, newly planted pastures. We've got some unwanted grasses, whether it be uh, barnyard grass, crabgrass, things like coming in, in there. So we need to manage past that so we get that clean uh, field of coastal coming up so they can produce a marketable product on in the future. So holler at us if you got a question. That's what our job is there to help you, and the Extension Office uh, does our goal. And, again, we've got a variety of resources. The university is there to help us out. So, again, the information we're sharing is science-based, fact-based, repeatable, and, again, where it's not hearsay. So what we're going to work with is going to be something we can count on. We appreciate you being with us today, and hopefully you, uh, if you, you know, it provides some information will help you out. And uh, watch the horn flies this weekend. Bye-bye. Thanks for checking out this podcast of Lone Star Community Radio, Montgomery County's community radio station. If you enjoyed this recording, make sure to check out our past shows online at IRLoneStar.com or their respective video or podcast formats on YouTube, Google Play, or iTunes. If you have any questions regarding the show, either it being about sponsorships or questions for the host, contact the station manager at D-I-C-K at IRLoneStar.com or call the station at 936 647 3776. This show was recorded in downtown Conroe, Texas at the Lone Star Community Radio Studio. And Lone Star Community Radio reserves all rights to this recording and images.